I will go ahead and assume that most of you have a camera you plan to use already. But for those of you who do not have access to a camera yet, or if you're in the market for a new camera, this lesson's for you. Cameras can be categorized in many ways. I'll do my best to try and simplify these categories for you. The main type of cameras are phone cameras, film cameras, point and shoot cameras, DSLR cameras, mirrorless cameras, and drones. I won't spend a bunch of time talking about phones or film cameras in this lesson, as most of you are either going to stick with with your phone or you'll be looking to make the jump to a DSLR or mirrorless camera. The film world is complex and frankly, I do not have a ton of experience with it. However, if this is something you are wanting to learn, please let me know by shooting me a message. In terms of cell phones, honestly, the top of the line Samsung and iPhones are really good nowadays. So if you are tight on your budget, then don't worry. 90% of the content in this course will still be applicable to you. Also, I'll be launching an entire sub series on phone photography very soon. Point and shoot cameras are straightforward. They are small enough to fit in your pocket and are typically limited in the amount of control it provides the user. They will have only one lens element that either allows for internal or digital zoom capabilities. I would highly recommend not buying one of these types of cameras if you already have a smartphone from the last three years and are not interested in making the jump to a more professional style camera. DSLRs have been the market leader in the digital photography space since their inception. The name DSLR stands for digital single lens reflex camera and stems from the original film SLRs that photography was built on. DSLRs are unique in the fact that they allow for interchangeable lenses, which is the main reason I recommend people to switch to either a DSLR or a mirrorless camera rather than their phones if they have the budget to do so. DSLRs open up a whole new set of abilities for you as a photographer with their longer battery life, large storage capabilities, interchangeable lenses to create different perspectives and quality, and a thing called autofocus. Mirrorless cameras are the newest genre of cameras in the market, and this is the type of body I personally use. Mirrorless cameras get their name from the fact that they do not have a mirror which reflects light into the optical viewfinder. In a DSLR camera, this mirror will then move out of the way when you click the shutter button, which then exposes light to your sensor, thus capturing your photograph. Without diving into the science of it too much, mirrorless cameras remove that mirror element and use a digital process instead. This allows for mirrorless camera bodies to be lighter, quieter, and arguably sharper due to the lack of moving elements inside the body. Mirrorless is the future of photography, and you continue to see more and more companies push the market towards these types of cameras because of the advanced features they can implement. Drones are almost an essential piece of kit for photographers who focus primarily on real estate and outdoor adventure photography. However, I would still consider these a specialty item that should not be a priority until you see an absolute need for it. Drones are heavily regulated and the FAA requires that you pass a part 107 pilots test to be able to monetize your services with your drone. I will provide resources in the drone section of this course for those of you who are interested in taking the part 107 at some point. It's also important to note that if you plan to do primarily landscape photography, state and federal parks do not allow the use of drones. If you plan to primarily shoot, let's say in Yellowstone, then do not look into getting a drone as it will be a waste of time and money. Now that we have discussed the main genres of cameras, let's look at the main subsets, which has to do with your sensor size. The sensor is what your camera exposes to light to create your photograph. Depending on the size of your sensor, the field of view, depth of field, and other elements will be altered. The main sensor sizes are micro four thirds, APS-C, full frame, and medium format. Micro four Four thirds cameras are primarily found in Olympus and Panasonic cameras and have not been widely adopted by other camera manufacturers. I decided to include this sub style because you are starting to see this sensor size pouring over into other areas such as smartphones and drones. These styles of cameras are compact and light which allows for easy storage and pack weight. These cameras can also be fairly inexpensive which makes a great entry point for those of you looking to make a jump to the mirrorless or DSLR system. APS-C or also known as crop sensor cameras are arguably the most popular starting point for photographers. I began my journey on a crop sensor, which primarily was because of the lower cost on bodies and lenses. Crop sensors get their nickname since the field of view is significantly cropped in when compared to a full frame 35 millimeter sensor. Typically, you will see a 1.6 to 2X crop factor depending on the manufacturer, which means that a 50 millimeter lens on a 1.6 crop sensor camera will act more like an 80 millimeter lens. You can use full frame lenses on a crop sensor which is great for building out your kit before making the jump to a full frame camera body. 
However, the glass made for full frame cameras is expensive. So if budget is tight, the lens is made specifically for crop sensor cameras may be the right starting point for you. Crop sensors are great because the size, weight, and cost of entry compared to the full frame lineup. Image quality is pretty good on the newer models coming out, which means that you'll be able to grow a long way with this type of body. In fact, I spent seven and a half years shooting on a crop sensor before I made the jump to full frame. Crop sensors do have a few pain points to be aware of. First, they do not perform as well as the full frame cameras in low light situations. Due to the sensor being smaller, crop sensors do not allow for a ton of light to hit the sensor as is. So with limited light comes poor results. Crop sensors also do not allow for the same amount of bokeh, which is the term used for that creamy smooth blurred out backgrounds you notice in those portraits you love so much. This won't be that big of a deal when you're first starting out, but when you do make the switch to full frame, you'll never want to go back. The last con to consider is the fact that the details and overall resolution of crop sensors does not compare to full frame cameras. However, with the cost savings you receive with APS-C cameras and the size and weight consideration, these cameras really pack a punch for those looking to take gorgeous photos. Full frame cameras are exactly what they sound like. They utilize the full size of the 35 millimeter sensor, unlike the crop sensors. This is the camera style choice I utilize in my kit, mostly because the amount of light I can utilize, the overall image quality and sharpness, and the creamy smooth backgrounds with a full frame feel of view. Full frames are typically bigger. However, with the advancement of mirrorless cameras, this issue is slowly being resolved. Full frame cameras also are paired with higher quality of lens selections, which is a large contributor to the overall quality of your images. Another pro to full frame cameras is the ability to handle low light situations well. We will discuss this more in the section on camera settings, but full frame cameras are the best when it comes to handling higher ISO increments. This is helpful for me personally, as I do shoot a lot of night sky images. So having the the flexibility is a must for my workflow. The last thing I want to point out about full frame cameras is that they typically capture images with a higher dynamic range, which allows for amazing shadow and highlight recovery in post. This is helpful for portrait and sports photographers when they typically have to get the shot in one take. For landscape photography, this has almost fully removed the need for exposure blending in my post-processing workflow, as I find that I can capture the full gamut in one exposure. The flip side to this is the fact that full frame camera files will be huge, which means you'll need better storage solutions for your post processing. Medium format is the last style of sensor we'll talk about in this section. Medium format cameras boast a sensor size much larger than what you'll find in an APS-C or full frame camera. They are usually bulky, heavy, and very, very expensive. However, companies such as Fujifilm have recently began to mitigate some of these issues with their mirrorless line of medium format cameras. Medium formats have a much wider field of view than a full frame camera. Their depth of field is also a lot shallower than a full frame camera, which means that a 5.6 aperture on a medium format could produce an image with bokeh similar to a f2.8 aperture or lower on a full frame camera. These cameras are also known for their crazy resolutions and accurate color reproduction. Medium format cameras are often a reach for active professionals and are often overkill for what most of us will be producing in our photography careers. Now that we have talked about some basic concepts of camera bodies, let's jump over to the next section where we'll talk about some of the major items I look for when buying a camera. I'll catch you guys in the next one.